Uh, Scala memes on Google Images, and this is some of the uh, results that you'll get. Uh, some of these are trying to say Scala is cool, and you can see stuff like uh, Scala when coding feels like flying, that's great. And I think if you've been working with Scala for uh, long enough, you'd think so too. Uh, but m I'd, I'd dare to say that most of these are probably not as positive. Uh, most of them have kind of a common, uh, trying to convey a common message that Scala is not for everyone, Scala is difficult. There's this, uh, this is Scala, uh, paraphrasing this is Sparta, of course, uh, which suggests that you'd have to be some kind of super warrior that can take any suffering and pain uh, in order to be programming in Scala. And uh, this uh, super famous one where the late Ned, Ned Stark says uh, one does not simply walk into Scala uh, and, uh, uh, and many others. My personal favorite is this one. I came from the desert to program Scala, which means you'd have to be Chuck Norris to kind of take this challenge challenge on. And I'm here to say you don't have to be Chuck Norris and my first proof for that point is the fact that I am not Chuck Norris. Oh great, it's uh, uh, chopped. We'll have to live with that. Uh, I'm not Chuck Norris uh, and I've been programming in Scala for about two years. Uh, I'd, I'd say successfully and definitely uh, I've been enjoying it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a Scala expert. Uh, might be weird that I'm standing here in Scala panel, but I'm not a Scala expert. I, uh, term, I would say I'm uh, maybe an advanced beginner or, or maybe competent uh, on a scale of one to five, perhaps three or three and a half. Uh, and uh, my point here would be that uh, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good if you want to create uh, a good uh, code and uh, give some value to wherever you work or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, a little bit about Kenshu. I won't talk too much about that, about that because Erez, our chief architect, will give you a few minutes uh, because we are sponsoring this uh, uh, con uh, conference as well. Uh, we are a 10-year-old Tel Aviv-based st startup. We've been named industry leader in dig digital marketing. What does that mean? We create technology for uh, some of the largest advertisers in the world to efficiently and somewhat automatically optimize and manage their online campaigns. Uh, and we are mostly a Java and JavaScript shop, like so many uh, uh, companies out there. Uh, um, most of the backend is Java, most of the frontend is JavaScript. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, as for Scala, we started adopting Scala about two years ago. We became we became kind of more serious about it in the last uh, six months or so. We have five services already running in production in Scala. Uh, most uh, the developers that are already working in Scala are uh, uh, enthusiastic about it enough to set up a kind of a Scala course, internal course uh, for other developers to kind of join uh, the club and 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 to make Scala our. Uh, number one choice for any future uh, project. So, I said before, it's scary. All those memes talk about how Scala is not for everyone. I'm going to I'm going to take the first half of this presentation to go through some examples of why is this scary, or what is it about Scala that makes uh, so many people a bit weary, or, or, or some developers don't think that they can take Scala on. So one good example is something like this. Uh, I don't know about you, but after two years of Scala, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, and I guess most people won't. Uh, this is actual code. Uh, found it online. It does something. Don't know what. And a guy named Z Zed Shaw, who's a pretty uh, prominent uh, developer. He wrote some books. He's a Ruby guy, mostly. Uh, saw this and said, like, what the hell? Uh, is this normal Scala code? Uh, what's going on? This can't be it. And this is kind of the sentiment uh, that Scala, uh, uh, rightfully or not, uh, uh, earned uh, that I think makes people uh, um, kind of scared. Uh, another example is this uh, Stack Overflow question. Uh, this is the second most uh, voted Stack Overflow question about Scala. It's been written about six years ago by someone who saw the new implementation of the collection library and said... <laughs> okay. Better now? Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this guy saw the new implementation, which was new back then, of the collections library and said, this is very useful, but it's 
horrible. And he said, is this the longest suicide note in history, which, which is apparently a quote from some political party uh, uh, in Britain. Uh, but his point being is that things like the map method uh, in the collections library is definitely useful. You can see that the usage is very simple. We create a list, we map each string to its length. It's very short, concise, clear, and we get a list of ints. Great. But if you go and look at the, this method's signature, then you see this thing. You see the implicit, you see the can build from, which I don't know what that is, and uh, uh, four different uh, type parameters. So. His point was, this is intimidating, we are going to kind of scare everybody off and Scala is going to die. Well, obviously, Scala didn't die, he, he was wrong about that one, and here we are six years later uh, at this uh, conference and Scala is still gaining popularity, uh, not only here, but maybe he has a point, maybe people that see this can just uh, uh, get scared and run away. Uh, now we've seen some of these more advanced uh, uh, examples and we didn't even try to understand them. Let's look at examples that can kind of occur in anyone's uh, code base. Something more down to earth, uh, and even though it's down to earth, it still can be confusing for Scala developers. So here's the first example. We create a list of tuples, uh, all integers, and we just want to extract a, a list of the first items, the one, three, and five. Uh, here are three ways to do it. If you know some Scala, this should be pretty st straightforward. Uh, we map uh, the elements of the list using underscore, the, the anonymous parameter, uh, and then underscore one, the first item. Another option is to name it. Instead of leaving it unnamed, uh, we can name it tuple, for example. And the same thing with different parentheses, which is already a little bit weird, uh, but that's not the whole story. Here are five more ways to do exactly the same thing, or almost exactly the same thing. And here, all of these use pattern matching. Pattern matching is cool, and it's very useful uh, in many scenarios, including this one. So here are five different versions. We name the parameter, then we create a pattern matching uh, expression. We match it to a, cup, a tuple of ID and value, and we just take the ID. Uh, the next option is the same, but with an anonymous uh, parameter instead of T. Then we can kind of just drop the match. Uh, this is a perfect example of syntactic sugar. If the compiler can kind of understand what we want with less syntax, with less uh, words, with less symbols, uh, Scala often uh, chooses to do so. And in this case, indeed, we can just drop this and keep that. Then we can drop the parents, and then we can notice that we're not really using the value uh, uh, parameter uh, that we just named, so we can leave it unnamed, uh, uh, which is just gives us yet another option of how to write this very, very simple things. So altogether, we have eight different ways to do a very uh, everyday task that we do hundreds of times in our code base. Another example. Um, we have two case classes, a profile and a profile ID, which is just kind of uh, boxing around an int because we wanted to name it uh, for whatever reason. And the load profile uh, method that takes a profile ID and returns a profile. Uh, pretty straightforward, again, nothing special. So here are four ways to invoke this method. We can create the case class without the new keyword. We can create it with the new keyword. And then we can also do the same two uh, uh, possibilities with a named parameter, another cool Scala feature. But again, we ended up with so many different ways to do the most basic of things, just invoking a method. Uh, to make things more complicated, we can uh, get fancy and create an implicit conversion from an integer to this case class of profile ID, which is something you can uh, see quite uh, commonly uh, because we are too, uh, I don't know, lazy or we, don't, we want the brevity of not having to write uh, this profile ID here. And now we can invoke the method with an integer. Uh, either named or unnamed parameter uh, because the implicit conversion will kick in and convert it into a case class. So again, many, many different ways to do the same thing. And if I'm a Scala beginner and I'm looking at load profile 3, I'm definitely going to look for a method that takes an int and probably I won't be able to find it. Uh, so we can see where some of the confusion comes from. One last example before we uh, move on. Um, 
we have a load int, whatever it does, the name load suggests that it maybe uh, takes a while to happen, it has some performance penalty, and a function f that takes this type, which is a function from zero parameters, zero arguments into an int, and we call f with an anonymous function that calls load int and adds two. Okay? It's, this could happen, functional programming, nice, we, we can take functions and values. And what would happen here is that when in the body of f, when we invoke value, we would obviously invoke load int. If we never invoke it, load int will never be invoked. If we invoke it, invoke it three times, load int would be invoke, invoked three times. That's, uh, uh, that's basic, right? Um, so for these kind of uh, um, scenarios, when we have methods taking zero arguments, we can replace them with the call by name syntax, which is almost the same. Uh, we just, it looks very similar. We just uh, drop these parents, but actually the type that f now takes is very different. It's an int. It's not a function, uh, but the behavior would be the same, right? Call by name means that we don't evaluate this expression here. We are going to evalu evaluate it within F's body whenever we access value. So again, two ways, uh, not that trivial anymore, but two different ways to achieve practically the same uh, thing. So. Is it too much sugar? Do we have, we, Scala definitely is flexible, but is this flexibility just too much uh, to take? And, and what's the problem here? What's really getting in the way of developers from understanding what's going on? Uh, we can categorize what we've seen so far uh, into three uh, categories. One is just too many ways to write the same thing. I've, I've said it over and over. The second is there's this trade-off between short and readable, and Scala kind of gives us gives us the choice. Uh, we can make things almost as short as we'd like, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, when we make it too short, the readability goes away, and it's up to us to kind of choose where we're at, and if we just, each one chooses whatever they like uh, when they read a, a specific line of code, and if I choose differently uh, for each line of code that I read, then obviously uh, there's just too many forms uh, uh, bundled up in my, in my code base. And the third one is those advanced features that are kind of creeping the code, and maybe I haven't got up to speed on all of them, and suddenly very basic things like invoking a method can have an implicit or a call by name or stuff that I, not everybody still understands, uh, but it's, it may be all over the place. Uh, it's not limited to implementing things that are specifically complex or hard, because I can use them wherever I want. Okay, so those are the main issues that I want to address, uh, and I believe those are the main, main issues that make Scala uh, intimidating for many developers. So, what's the insulin? How do we kind of treat this syntactic diabetes, this overdose of uh, sugar? The solutions that I'm going to kind of list today are pretty uh, uh, straightforward, nothing fancy, nothing that you haven't heard before, but I think that putting them all together in a list and making sure that mostly as organizations or as development teams uh, that we follow these rules uh, really could help a lot in onboarding as many developers as you'd like uh, into your Scala projects. Uh, so let's start looking into them. Uh, the first very helpful tool that we've been using from day one and found to be uh, extremely important is using style guides. Most languages, or all languages maybe, have style guides, but usually they are kind of limited to very uh, basic styling things, like should I add a new line before a curly braces, or shouldn't I? Uh, how do I name? What's the naming convention for uh, methods, classes, uh, variables, and so on? In Scala's case, these style guides, as Scala is a bit more flexible, these style guides tend to try and help us with that flexibility as well. We look into three different style guides that we've been using. I'm sure there are others uh, out there. Uh, the first one is the official uh, Scala Lang style guide, and there's a link here if you'd like to uh, uh, review any of these later. And it's pretty basic. Mostly it's the styling things, like naming conventions and stuff, uh, but it also has a few tips of when should I use specific uh, uh, features, like implicits, and when shouldn't I use them, uh, which make a little bit of sense and can be easily understood and checked. Uh, when I see an implicit, I can check is it what they meant or isn't it, and which makes our code a little bit uh, uh, more conventional. 
The next style guide, I call it the conservative style guide, and it's a Databricks uh, a Scala style guide. Databricks is the company behind uh, Apache Spark. Apache Spark is an open source tool written in Scala, and they have their own style guide. And I call it the conservative because it limits the usage of most of the fancy stuff, uh, uh, and for, for most of them, it, it really says just don't do it. It avoids a lot of nice features in Scala, uh, because they figure out that it's more important for them to gain readability by as many developers as possible, uh, than it is to make sure that they produce the most idiomatic and most uh, uh, and pro uh, concise code that could be written for any given task. So uh, why, is that, why does that make sense for Apache Spark? Apache Spark is an open source uh, project which is very popular. It has both uh, many user, users and many uh, contributors. They passed the 1,000 contributors. It's the most active uh, project, a big data project on Apache. Uh, so it made sense for them to kind of limit the, uh, uh, the bar, uh, lower the bar of who can read the source code. Uh, by the way, they have uh, Scala, Java, and Python APIs, uh, so it's another uh, incentive to, if, if someone uses the Java API but still wants to look into the source code to understand the implementation, it would be nice if the implementation wouldn't be too far off away from uh, Java. Uh, so that's, I believe, why they chose to kind of go very conservative. We started with that style guide uh, because we started Scala for projects that used Apache Spark. Uh, that, that was our first usage. Uh, so if we, we thought if we use the same style guide, we can read our own code and their code uh, evenly, and it really worked. But eventually, we kind of moved on. Uh, and the last one I want to um, note is Twitter's effective Scala. It's not precisely a style guide, uh, but it's kind of a little bit the same as the, the Databricks Scala style guide in terms of uh, putting do's and don'ts uh, regarding uh, Scala's features. Uh, but this one is much more exhaustive. It does a better job of explaining each one of the, uh, of the features. It's actually a good place to start learning Scala. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, uh, read. Uh, and it's, it's a bit more um, liberal, I would say. It gives you more uh, freedom to to use some of the more advanced uh, Scala features, but it does give you limits where you should use them and where you shouldn't. I'll give examples in just a minute. And the last Scala style you'd probably need is your own. Eventually, just like I described Apache Spark's specific requirement, how they are an open source company and they want to have Java developers using their product as well, uh, you probably have specific requirements and given enough time, uh, for us it happened after, I don't know, a year and a half maybe, and more than one project, you kind of figure out your own rules. Uh, you can kind of pick and choose from the existing uh, style guides and add your own stuff. Uh, so uh, eventually we have some of our own homegrown uh, rules. A few examples. So the Twitter Scala, st Scala style guide, or effective Scala, uh, says do not use implicits to do automatic conversions between similar data types, which is pretty much don't do that thing that I said before, uh, automatic uh, boxing of the integer into something else. Uh, of course, it makes this uh, shorter, but they say it's, it's just not worth the, the, the readability uh, uh, penalty that you get when someone looks at the code. Uh, just don't do it. And they do go and list, uh, I think, five different use cases where implicits are good to use. And we do use them in some of those, at least. Uh, so it, they don't say don't use implicits, uh, unlike the Databricks uh, style guide, by the way. They, said, they say use implicits when you have to do X, Y, or Z. And that makes sense. Uh, an example from the Databricks style guide, don't use infix uh, notation for methods uh, that aren't symbolic methods, that aren't kind of operators. Uh, don't use string, uh, space contains, space foo. Uh, just use string dot contains dot foo. Why? It's just, it, you don't get much from, don't get much brevity or conciseness from it, and it just confuses people, so just don't do it, unless it's something like this. Uh, that also makes sense. Um, Another one from Twitter, use pattern matching directly in function definitions whenever applicable, which, is, which means just drop the match keyword and the 
uh, argument before it if you can. And indeed, for us as readers, when we see the case class, the case uh, uh, keyword, sorry, uh, it's pretty obvious that there's pattern matching here. So this rule also kind of makes sense. And you can see how we gradually just drop some of these extra uh, options that we had. We started with eight, and gradually we just drop them. And if you follow the style guide, you can end up with just one or two, and then you do have to apply some common sense uh, uh, to end up with the one you actually need. But your uh, options are kind of narrowed down to something that is much saner, uh, like in any other language that you'd use. A few more examples. Avoid using call by name. We talked about that too. Choose this option. Uh, the call by name, the main problem here that they cite, uh, the Databricks style guide, is that when you look at the method invocation, when you look at the call site, you have no idea that this is a call by name. So you'd have to look at the actual signature to understand that the evaluation uh, would happen only later. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, Scala provides an exception facility, but do not use it for commonplace errors. Uh, another good tip from Twitter. You can write use exceptions just like you're using them in Java, uh, but this is kind of flow control, and the whole uh, zen of functional programming and Scala is not to use too much flow con control and try to say what you have to say using the type system mostly. So instead of throwing ex an exception, if you can't find that int that you want to return, you have many, many good options to kind of return a value that can encapsulate the two possible results, whether it's an option, whether I have an int or nothing, a try, I have an int or an exception, uh, and either I have an int or something else, or your own. You can obviously create your own types that mean more than one thing and just uh, use them. Uh, the last one is something that we didn't find in any uh, uh, style guide, but we do follow that rule. Uh, so this is Kenshu here. Uh, avoid using tuple field names like underscore one, which we've also seen, uh, because obviously these underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, uh, they're hard to read. They don't mean much if you don't go back to where these tuples were created and understand uh, the order, and we don't like that. Uh, so usually pattern matching, if applicable, can do a much better uh, job, like these two options. So these were all kind of uh, good rules to follow. And again, I encourage you to find your most appropriate style guide and try uh, reading them and applying those rules. Uh, but you might be thinking to yourself, that's nice. Convention is important. Uh, we can always, we always should follow convention, but we also know that following convention is hard and tedious and kind of manual. Uh, you have to. How do you enforce uh, uh, convention when you have many developers? And the answers here are the usual answers, I'm afraid. Uh, some of them are more manual, some of them are more automatic. We'll go through them. One of them is code reviews. Uh, in Kenshu, we use code reviews quite extensively. Uh, it's uh, an integral part of how we ship code. Everything goes through uh, peer code review. So kind of adding more things to note when you review code is not too difficult. It doesn't break our, uh, our method of working. It's, we, we can just uh, add things and, and think about more things than when we review code. Uh, in this specific case, obviously, uh, the tip would be to refer to the style guide. If you see a violation or if you debate with yourself how should this have been written, you can go to the style guide and figure it out. And the good, things about, the good thing about style guide is that it's not kind of opinion based. Uh, it's mostly very uh, easy to apply rules and when you kind of take the opinion factor away, that's when code reviews become more productive and less of uh, just uh, philosophical discussion, which is nice but not very uh, productive usually in the, in, the, in the scope of code reviews. Another good tip if we are uh, discussing code reviews is to kind of mix and match uh, Scala levels. Uh, you, you'd always have the uh, Scala enthusiast that went ahead and, and is a bit more advanced, and you'd have some new, uh, newer developers that maybe joined the team and started picking up Scala. And I'd say in this sense, when we talk about uh, 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 the insulin for the syntactic diabetes and we talk about convention, uh, often it is very good to have the junior Scala developers review code of the senior because that's the only test for readability that you'd get. If they can read your code, you're okay. If they can't, 
you probably messed up because you're aiming for some common uh, uh, level, common convention, and if they can't read it, maybe you strayed from that convention. Uh, so, and that, that's always a good tip, by the way, but specifically it helps with this uh, problem. Um, but still, I said, uh, no, sorry, a few examples uh, from real code, real uh, pull requests uh, in Kenshu. So, uh, like we said, try instead of try catch, use this, as we've seen in one of the style guides. And another place when we uh, uh, I created a method with a parenthesis uh, with no arguments, and then uh, Moran kind of stopped stopped and th thought, should we have? Uh, the parentheses here, or shouldn't we? I don't remember. Do we have it in the style guide? Don't we? And then uh, she went and found actually that the uh, Scala style guide, uh, the official Scala style guide, uh, uh, explicitly says when you should omit the parentheses and when you shouldn't. In this case, only methods which, which act as accessors should be declared without parentheses, except if they have side effects. That's pretty clear, of course. Do they have side effects is a question that is not always 100% straightforward, but it's usually easy to uh, agree upon or understand. And that's it. We have the rule. Now we remember it. We follow it. Maybe we should go back and look at other places where we kind of forgot to follow that rule. But these th things come up in code review, and eventually your code gets kind of more, uh, makes more sense when you look at it as a whole. Um, so of course, code reviews are manual, whatever can be automated should be automated, and that's why you have style checkers. As in other languages, uh, I said before, they all have style guides, and usually they also have style checkers because we don't, you don't have to do all this manual uh, uh, validation uh, yourself. Uh, in Scala's case, there's Scala style, which is, I think, by far the most uh, 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 popular one. There's a kind of new one, Scala FMT, which also reformats the code uh, uh, automatically, which is very nice. I played with it a little bit, and it's cool. Uh, they all come as, uh, they both come as plugins. Uh, the first one for SB SBT, Gradle, Maven, Eclipse, IntelliJ, whatever you uh, uh, use is probably in that list. Uh, so these simply automate some of the rules that can be automated. Not everything can be automated, but, so but some of the rules can. Here's an example of, uh, I kind of violated some rules intentionally and ran the SBT plugin for, of Scala style, and I got an error, public methods have type message, which means you violated the rule that says public methods must have an explicit type. As you know, in Scala, I can leave it uh, for the compiler to infer. Uh, in the case of private methods or local variables, that often makes a lot of sense. In the case of public methods, I would like to help uh, the user, the, the whoever is going to use that method uh, as much as I can, so I shouldn't leave it empty. And as this is an error, this would break our build. And this code would not make it into uh, master, would not make it to production. It's part of the flow, uh, and, it, and you can customize both of these tools, uh, add rules, just make sure that the rules match your style guide, and, uh, and they automate some of the work for you. OK. The last uh, tool, and it's kind of both a tool and, uh, and uh, and uh, the problem itself, maybe, uh, that I'd like to discuss are Scala levels. Uh, we've said, the, the, I think, the last bullet that we, that we described as the issues that we want to uh, tackle here was advanced features kind of getting in the way of uh, readability. Um, in 2011, Martin Odersky, Scala creator, uh, wrote this post about uh, how we can kind of slice Scala into different levels. And his point in this post was that you don't only kind of just bucket the features into, into uh, uh, levels for no reason. The reason being, you can just choose your own level and you'd be able to do good work with that level only. And that's, I think, is the most important uh, part about uh, this whole notion. Um, you don't have to be an expert in everything Scala has to offer in order to create good Scala code that accomplishes the job and would probably make you more uh, um, productive than many other languages 
Uh, I usually compare to Java, which is what we usually do, uh, but any other language. Um, so in our case, in Kenshu, we kind of chose uh, the expert application programmer level and the junior library designer level, and I'll get into details in a minute. Uh, we are obviously apl application programmers. We create uh, a product for our clients to use. Uh, we, are ra we rarely you, uh, create libraries. Of course, you always create some code that is more uh, 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 generic and for your own other code to use. But we are not library designers. Uh, so this made sense for us to just stick with the basics here, but try to go all the way uh, with our application programming skills. So let's see what these actually mean. On the application programmer side, we have a beginner, intermediate, and expert. For the beginner, basic syntax, simple closures, uh, knowing how to use collections and for expressions should be enough. And obviously, if you just know these, uh, reading the source code of the Scala uh, collections library would be pretty uh, either hard on or impossible, but the point being you can write your own code that works and does a pretty good job. Uh, I'd say this is pretty much like using Java 7. Um, there's not much in Java that isn't covered by everything that you have here. Maybe I'm uh, 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 doing uh, Scala a bit too much justice, but it's close. Um, but it's not too hard to go to the next level of intermediate and add some pattern matching and trade composition and recursions, specifically tail recursions, uh, which kind of gets you one level up. Uh, and you can stop there and create good Scala code that works and does the job and uh, 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 works well. Uh, we actually decided to go all the way into the expert level, uh, mostly because, again, we started with Apache Spark, and Spark is all about uh, lazy data structures and folds, like fold left, fold right. It's it's kind of a map reduced based uh, solution, and folding is is uh, uh, integral to doing that work. So it's not like we had a choice. Uh, we learned these things to use Apache Spark anyway, so it wasn't too much work to go all the way into expert. But in other people's case, if you don't use Spark or any heavy data machinery, then uh, intermediate level is. Uh, really quite powerful. Uh, as for the library uh, designer levels, uh, here you can see most of the uh, type system advanced features, uh, which I would assume are the scarier things in Scala or the things that kind of are used uh, to show uh, people how powerful Scala is, uh, but maybe makes uh, 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 the opposite effect of, of uh, kind of scaring them off. So you have the type parameters, which is kind of basic. You, you do need that. Uh, traits, lazy values, uh, carrying, and by name parameters. They, these are all here. And these are indeed uh, are not too hard to pick up. And then you have all the more advanced features, existential types, cake pattern, early initializers, abstract types, and so on and so forth. I don't even know all of these. Uh, and as I said, we, as, uh, as, a, as a team, uh, kind of settled with L1, which means we try not to use these, if we can, in our code base, to make sure that whoever is a junior uh, library designer level and application programmer uh, uh, expert can read all our code and make sense of it. And here's maybe a good point uh, to discuss this distinction between library designer and application programmer. In this same post, uh, Odersky kind of explains uh, why there's a difference. And of course, when we create libraries, we mostly create code for other code to work with, uh, of course. And that's, that makes sense that all these type system uh, features are in this uh, uh, bucket and not in the application programming. When we program an application, our data is actual data, and we have usually kind of a concrete case uh, to handle. And when we program a library, obviously uh, the concrete case is someone else's problem, and we want to supply tools that would work with his type or their type. So uh, that kind of makes sense. And that brings us back to that Stack Overflow question that we started with, uh, the 2.8 collection issue uh, that was supposedly the longest suicide note in history, uh, and a case of that. Well, this is part of Martin's, Martin Odersky's own answer, and this is the top voted answer and the accepted answer, and it's a longer answer, I just took a snippet of it, that basically says, well, 
Of course, the, uh, the signature of map is complex because it does very complex things and it gives an example. We can create a bit set, which is a very highly optimized implementation of a collection of positive integers. It can only store positive integers and nothing else, uh, but it's very, very efficient uh, in memory and performance. Uh, and so we create a bit set with one, two, and three, and we can call that map function that we're talking about uh, and add one, obviously adding one to a positive integer will also return a positive integer. So we can still get a bit set in return. And indeed, the returned value is of type bit set. However, if we use map with some function that returns another type, in this case a string, magically, and we just heard that magic is not that good, but in this case it seems that magically we get uh, uh, a, a, a generic Scala collection immutable set of strings and not a bit set. We didn't get an exception, which might have been uh, uh, common in other collection frameworks, uh, but we actually just called map and got a new uh, uh, collection and we can keep working with it. Of course it cannot be a bit set because bit set cannot store strings, but as a user we got a very powerful thing that we sometimes maybe don't even notice. Uh, and that's why the library has to be so sophisticated. And that kind of relates to the same uh, notion of kind of slicing up Scala into levels. To create the collection library of Scala, you have to be uh, obviously a library uh, uh, expert. Uh, cause, because you have to support advanced stuff like this, which I don't know if they're even supported in any other collection library. Um, but it, as a user, I can choose not to go all the way through, or actually to just prioritize and not yet understand how to create this kind of library, but I can definitely use it quite effectively, and I'd say more effectively than I'd use other collection libraries, which, which would have required quite a lot of work, work from my side to solve a use case like this. So, just to conclude, we've seen that intermediate Scala works. You don't have to be a Scala superstar or an, or an expert uh, to get good results. I'd say much better results that, than you'd get uh, with uh, Java, even if, if you're an expert, expert Java developer. Uh, that's my personal uh, belief about myself, that as an intermediate Scala developer, I'm better at my work than I, would have, than I will uh, as a Java developer, even though I programmed Java for 10 years and I consider myself a much better Java developer than Scala developer. Um, you can control the style and feature set. Uh, you can make sure that you don't let your Scala code run loose. Uh, you obviously have this one rogue developer that learned a new cool thing and will try to uh, add it to your source code. Uh, but maybe you should, as a team, make the uh, uh, adult uh, uh, decision to kind of limit what goes into your source code, or maybe if it's something specifically that requires uh, uh, some, uh, you know, of the most advanced features, you can make sure it's encapsulated and well hidden, like the implementation of the Scala collection library. And mostly, no Chuck Norris is required. You really don't have to be uh, something special, I think. And I and I did think two years ago that, okay, only only a handful of us will kind of get how to work with Scala, and I don't think so anymore. If you are a good developer and your team is a team of good, good developers, there's no reason uh, you won't be able to uh, get really good results uh, with, with Scala, I believe. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, up there. Yes. I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was about uh, code reformatters. If you already have a large code base and you want to apply your uh, 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 automatic uh, reformat, uh, it creates just a huge change and a lot of noise. Uh, how do you avoid that? Did I, yeah? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know of any other uh, option. Uh, when we do reformat code, we just make sure that it's kind of a separate 
uh, change set. Uh, sometimes you go into some class and it's messy, but you also have to kind of add your own thing, fix a bug, or just create something new. Uh, so we try as best we can to separate the two so that uh, tracing the changes and reviewing the code would be uh, sane. But yes, maybe you'll have this one or a few huge commits that just go over everything, but you know that you don't really have to look into those commits because they're well uh, uh, titled as reformatting. Uh, don't don't uh, look into this too much because it was automatic. No, no better way that I know of. Other questions? Okay, thank you.